while you, while you're doing that, I'm going to get started. I wanted to just read a real short excerpt from um, my book, Ghetto Plainsman, that will open up. As the jail cell door claimed shut, I sat on the cot, glad at least that the handcuffs were off. The obese store manager of the Port Isabel supermarket near the Mexican border had been following me around wearing his big pink apron, and despite him, I had stolen a 55 cent piece of foil wrapped cream cheese. The two jail cells were little more than a cage split in half by bars a few paces from the deputy's office. The other prisoner and I stared each other down through the bars. Vulgarity was written on the wall behind his head, with big scrawls written over that by somebody who had come later. On my side, there was a love, love song to some long ago female, complete with music notes drawn into the orange paint that had been stained by gulf air and the grime of inmates. Driving back to Corpus Christi a day later, scruffy and unwashed, halfway up I pulled onto the road shoulder and shut the car off. The whole western sky was lit up in a massive red-orange flattened twilight. The whole west... I could not believe that sky. I got out and walked across the empty road, stepping a few feet into the sparse, grassy brush. I heard a distant, piercing sound. Laughing or crying tingled my spine. I cocked my head, concentrating, hoping. The coyote howled again. I became conscious of the sea, the Gulf of Mexico, at my back, even though it was a couple dozen miles east. And again, I knew I was at the edge of another world. It was my world, a spiky, grassy terrain filled with animals that crawled and whispered, who pawed at the earth and flashed in the western sun, rolled their eyes, flicked their tongues, snorted, rumbled, or heaved their sides in twilight. Here I was, and out there, there was. It was my eternity. If I just stepped in, crossed it to the other side, I knew I couldn't be sure of coming back. The setting red sun was almost face level to me across the South Texas plain now, and the round ball of my face looked straight back into it, and the sun paid me no attention at all and sank, pulling the blue sky down with it. So, my name is Jared, I'm founder and CEO of Great Plains Restoration Council. And the long and short of it is I fell way below rock bottom and I had this crazy idea I was going to seek refuge in nature, but as I got further and further out into that uh, mythical world, I found a far worse war zone than I could have ever imagined. So, over a period of years, I, mean, I had this uh, intense struggle with um, what I came to see just uh, like a particular American violence and uh, led me to this uh, realization that the violence that we do to the earth mirrors the violence we do to each other and often except to ourselves. And while I was, you know, first I was way below rock bottom and then I got really angry. I was political militant and I was cutting fences and all that, trying to lash back and fight against all the destroyers of the world. Then I realized that my backlash, hatred and anger might make me a little different than all this uh, the destroyers and everything. So I worked on my own healing and built up uh, an organization called Great Plains Restoration Council. So we're based here in Houston. One of the things I, I ask people to do is uh, break down the, the boundaries that we allow our lives to be separated with. All, all problems stem from the root culture of separateness. And when I'm when we're out here, to me, in flyover country, I don't really see us as being just in these, these boxes. But, um, you know, this is the Great Plains is a region that flows from one, one ecosystem to another. And so these cities, to me, are like outposts in the Prairie Sea. The Prairie Sea is still, you know, still there, even if it, she, but she has been really damaged. So, in Great Plains Restoration Council, these are our two themes that we work with. I have two programs, Plains Youth Interaction and Restoration, Not Incarceration. And we have um, a new program just to allow this work to be available to anybody. Your Health Outdoors is just emerging now. But we take care of body and earth as one, and by taking care of others, we take care of ourselves. That's really fundamental to how we do everything when we work uh, out of the land. So, as I mentioned, these are our three programs. A lot of times, there have been a, a lot of, we hear people from all walks of life asking, can we, we want to come out and work, so that's why the third program now, rather than just a targeted uh, population, is through Your Health Outdoors. 
Ecological health, that's what we found, and it's an it's a na emerging national movement. And basically, ecological health is the interdependent health of humans, animals, and ecosystems. We have to stop being separate. <laughs> and our bodies are part of the ecosystem, too, as well as our relationships with ourselves and others. So, um, now, i got to tell you about prairie dogs. How many of y'all have ever seen a prairie dog? <laughs> All right, that's good. Um, these guys are the ultimate underdog. America's sun dogs they have experienced, you know, through tragically misguided beliefs, they have been the recipient of um, so much hatred and violence. They've been poison gassed or shot down to less than about, um, about 98% of them. Yet they've been here for a million years. And there's even, what's interesting is that they have even found some um, fossil evidence of these guys living all the way down here on the coast, which was uh, astronomical to us. There's an archaeological site off of, that's underwater now, but um, they've sound, seen some fossils uh, wash up. reason why, uh, to me, they represent everything that is wrong with our relationship with the prairies. Well, they don't live in this region anymore, but more in the higher and drier uh, areas. It, it's, it's like, y'all ever seen the um, Dr. Seuss, uh, Horton Hears a Who story? <laughs> well, they're saying, we are here, we are here. They, you know, they're like the coral reef and the sea of grass, and they represented original life and fertility. And through, through, they've been here for a million years, and they speak one of the most complex animal languages, yet they've just been the victims of so much, you know, unending violence that still comes today. They meet all five criteria of the Endangered Species Act, and yet they receive no protection. So a lot of our work is focused around, around them as uh, help, uh, helping us understand this violence that we, um, you know, wield against the land. Now, originally, we, in, on the prairies and plains, it was truly, you know, like a Serengeti on steroids. It was, we had, you know, an unimaginable garden of Eden. Every step of the way, of every step was just exploding with life. And you see an original painting of, of what it looked like. And even these little fragments that we have left of prairie, you can walk in it as I mean, a lot of y'all know. You just, it's, it's something completely different than anywhere else. But as we know, like the slaughter came, and uh, it was this, this uh, culture to, uh, to basically wipe out and tear down this Eden and turn it into something else. These are just skulls. And you've probably have seen some of these pictures. But those are just skulls. They even made an uh, industry off of uh, selling bones for several years. A lot of times, it's, since Texas is a little bit older and settlements started earlier here, but you know, Port Lavaca, that's named after buffalo. They didn't have a word for um, bison, so they used to all the way be down to the, to the coast. And then, you know, the prairie dogs, go, well, this is further in the west. This was the U.S. Geological Survey, just poison prairie dogs. So this was, this was you know, the, what we started with in the 1870s mentality. But this is today, and this is still going on, and our taxpayer dollars pay for this. A lot of times we're still wielding this. These are it's our national grassland in the panhandle of Texas, uh, of coyotes up in Yellowstone National Park, they step out of the, the, the boundaries, and this is what happens to our, our last wild bison. You know, you see killing contests, red mist aside, people blow them up for sport with this propane with bombs or whatever, or prairie dogs. This is in, and then, you know, the, the, the suffering continues. This is in Texas, a mule deer doe. So, you can see that we are dealing with some very serious problems, our relationships are very much broken. Now here, rather than, I didn't want to, I, I felt like our work needs to be like a living art project. I feel like there's so much fighting going on there's, you know, it's just, I wanted, when I started Great Plains Restoration Council, I wanted some, this work to be like a, something for the repair and rebuilding. I wanted the work to be a, cultural and social movement rather than just mathematics. We are talking about life. So, as we're, excuse me, somewhere, uh, the, thanks, um, 
As you know, there's less than one percent left of the coastal prairie, and so Pastor Rudy of St. John's downtown has donated some land in the Sunnyside neighborhood, and we actually are doing a demonstration park right there that is in um, just uh, off of Airport and 288. This this painting here, you may have seen this, but all that yellow there is what the prairie used to look like, and, there, and that green screen, green circle, is actually his uh, notation of that. But coincidentally, we found a a pocket prairie that's just a uh, virgin right next to the restoration site and this is, is uh, one of our crew members that we started with. We started with for, uh, homeless ex-offenders coming from the Bredo Life uh, shelter in St. John's downtown and what we, it was overgrown with Chinese towels so we had to work through a lot of uh, hands-on, we did it all by hand, we moved over a thousand towels and Japanese honeysuckle is still out there, thank you. And so what we did also was, you know, prairies, coastal prairies used to have a lot of uh, wetlands, little depressions, but so we decided to hand create one too. And we did it two tiers, and within the first, what's interesting is that the earth is so desperate for healing that within, within um, 10 minutes, we saw four different dragonflies uh, Prairie crawfish came up from out of the dirt, out of nowhere. You saw and one bird came. It was almost like out of out of the blue, just like that. And you see how we did it in two levels, so your your wetland plants could go along the side. We're in year two of the. This is natural after the rains, but we're in year two now of this restoration site. It's right off the South Acres in Cullen, and what it's being designed for is a, um, a demonstration place to to show people close in, uh, ecological health, understanding the coastal prairie, and then it will leverage out to a, a larger project. You can see the, the, that prairie that's next door to it. We're still trying to acquire that, and hopefully, the, because that's owned by the church next door, and it's a good seed source as well. And it's a lot of work, but you know, people like to get out. I should tell you that the work, a lot of times the people that I work with they may be at the end of their lives and they haven't even reached 22 or 23. You give people the opportunity to get outside and see, the, see um, first of all, that a participation in, in um, something that you do has some type of effect, as well as also even a, a longer conceptualization of time. I can tell you many people have a hard time conceiving at 3.45 this afternoon. Then we got to work towards next Wednesday. And then we have to work toward, you know, further on. But um, it's a, you see we're building some wetland plants there. A lot of times, all I can say is that it's easy to write off people who have been, or who are on the margins of society, but I can, you know that that same concept has been towards our prairies as well. So when we opened up the part of Vince Ryan, who's a supporter in the county's attorney's office, uh, we. Um, are now looking forward to the second year of this and getting it going. We also have, being part of that regional work, we have a, we're saving 2,000 acres of Fort Worth Prairie out, outside. So this is through our youth program. And we found two genetically pure bison that we reintroduced to, to this area. And the land is owned by the general land office, so we're still in a battle to formally protect it. But you can see the lush diversity of really wild, really healthy prairie. And almost nobody alive has walked inside wild virgin prairie, it's really important to try to like rebuild that culture because we really treat the prairies and the plains like, I mean, I think this country treats it like something like is dead and dried up in the corner. It's almost like we kept to shun our eyes from what, uh, what, what she represents now because um, they're, cause of what uh, all that has been done. You see eight, eight foot high big blue stem in this area and kids love to get outside and we do a lot of work. This is mostly preservation, but there is a lot of work there. And that's our Plains Youth Interaction Program. And some of our youth, when they go through this process, which I'll get into, we even uh, have been met by the people of the Obama administration. So, Esteban Park is uh, the leverage way for a new 20,000 acre preserve that's on the on upper Texas coast in the lower Trinity. This land is owned by the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers and we're beginning a restoration season this year. 
How many guys know these guys? Red wolves? You know, why are all our why are Texas wolves all in North Carolina? <laughs> I mean, when you read the old historical uh, stories and you see like how they just were, you know, sh shot and you, like even on Matagorda Island, I found this one news clipping, 200 of them, and so they're all they're all wiped out. Like, this was the original warfare, and there is, if we think longer term, you know, there especially on the Upper Texas Coast, there's room for them. They're not much bigger than coyotes, but I think that if we're going to look at deeper restoration and, and deeper healing from all the sadness and suffering. I think that it's okay to reach for, you know, true and wilder wilderness over the coming decades. So basically, here are where our projects, and uh, and you see that that that's where the big big um, uh, saltwater country project is. But all this up here is is um, a potential. There's, we're hoping that we can connect it in, just in case the seas rise. We're hoping to do some acquisition of another like 10,000 acres so or more that you allow the, the, the marshes and the uh, connectivity to move in as you, as you go. So that's, you see that the, you should know that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has received approval of an expansion of their national wildlife rivers along the coast. So you can see how some of this starts to come together. You know, they have 60,000 acre of uh, approval now for boundary expansion. So how we do this work, I think it's really, as, as educators, we, we to tell the story, but I want to see us utilizing nature as a therapeutic modality, work in nature, and not just becoming visitors to to the natural world of our own lives. You see, this, this is, the Lancet is one of the most uh, prestigious medical journals, and they say access to the natural environment can modify pathways to which low socioeconomic position can lead to disease. We've seen this, both physical and mental health benefits from nature. We've been doing ecological health work in the field since 2002. Organization was formed in 1999. But the, it's, it's really important to allow people to get their, you know, not just to be a visitor, but that while it has some positive effect, you can actually use it as a modality. And then, um, Interacting with nature shifts the mind to a more relaxed and passive mode, allowing more analytical powers to restore themselves. This is a, a mental health value. What we need to do as educators, as we start working more with social workers and university departments and advance the research, there's a lot of interest. Most of you have probably read Last Child in the Woods, but now um, when you get people outside and then you have them working, each step, the more that they're, they're process of immersion in it, the, the stronger the benefit you can have. We tend to look at the ecosystem like, just like how we would look at the social or the mental or physical condition of a person. So you start with an assessment, just like you would do a restoration ecology assessment, you'll do a social work assessment, and then you will do, we will, there will be a process of recovery through all that. And then the life wheel is our diagram of how we, we process out all this work. All right, whatever, whatever the ecosystem is, whether you know, the axle, this is designed off like a nice racing bike wheel. The axle is your, what you're working on, and that could, the ecosystem be, could be the prairie you're working on, or your school outside, or, or the person, and then the spokes, whether or yeah, I'm talking about critical thinking or any of these other tools that will then finally build to a life of, you know, wellness, altruism, critical thinking, and then the, you can utilize this as a, a uh, pathway to even employment or going on into their own life or hopefully new green jobs and this type of work. And, and underlying this are 12 components of ecological health. This is on our website, but I was inspired by this for a long time ago by Dr. King's Six Steps for, for Nonviolent Social Change. And I was, as I was thinking about this over years, I said, but well, we need something that is a stepwise manner that would build out a full person through taking care of our own health, through taking care of Mother Earth. And so uh, we just have to show you, we have two other projects. We have a Santa Fe County restoration site in uh, New Mexico and uh, finishing out an expansion of Badlands National Park in South Dakota. So while you're here and feel like you're here in Houston, you know, um, I don't want you to think that it's just Houston, but it's an emerging national movement. And everything you do is really, really important. 
I mean, even if you're going out and just creating a new uh, schoolyard prairie or helping people get, uh, get healthier and learn how to grow um, organic vegetables and eat healthier, people, the healthier people get it. And taking care of your own health is the most radical thing you can do. Now, that includes giving people the tools to do so. You can utilize this work to help people who have uh, physical disabilities or just even uh, uh, embrace their lives more or, um, or help people from Fifth Ward connect. It's an emerging national movement that's really important to allow people opportunities more than they ever thought that they could. So um, I think that we I have mentioned that we all know that we're facing some serious challenges over the next uh, several decades. We basically have, these are what I see as we have our choices. This is, this is the, the world that, that I embrace and a lot of you do, but as you also know, this is the other alternative. The, I, I was thinking about this boy who, these pictures came out of after the Chernobyl accident, and I think we have choices. I started thinking that this guy is like a superhero, uh, this poor little guy, and I just really feel like, you know the story when Esteban and Cabeza de Vaca and all of them came to Texas coast and we had this virgin prairie wilderness and people had to live with and alongside the land and the Karankula people. There was a chance to build a healthy, sustainable future. We you know two, two roads diverged in the Yellow Plain. We all know which direction we took, which was led us to this day. But Jane Goodall said, so here we are, half sinner, half saint, with two opposing tendencies inherited from our ancient past, pulling us now toward violence, now toward compassion and love. And while it's a lot of work, <laughs> I'm asking you to, uh, um, well, I know you all believe in it, but there are really tactical steps that you can take, and uh, we're here to help and, and uh, advance this forward. So thank you very much. Absolutely. The, we want, I mean, we're even doing an alternate spring break with Spelman and Morehouse from Atlanta next year. I mean, we're, I just got back from Atlanta, and we're also, um, that's going to be a really big two-city partnership. But for people, Esteban Park is close, and, and we, um, there's always lots of work. And we're trying, we're, we want, we're, we need to raise the capital to acquire the next play, the very next door. We do field trips. They want to come out and work. There's always work to do, and then they, everybody gets the 12 component sheet, and they get a little bit of ecological health training for that. So, um, can you take a field trip out to the coast? But that's what we're here for. Yes. Prairie dogs are being decimated by farmers and ranchers because of the holes that they dig and planting out. Like that. 65 million buffalo, tens of millions of pronghorn. You know, uh, all these other wild animals. Bighorn sheep bring on top of five billion prairie dogs. They didn't break their legs. So a lot of old wives, wives tales. Prairie dogs were even here back when the, the original horse, before they died out in the place, seemed was, was here. So that's a, the only time that a horse had broken his leg was when some human on top of him ran, in, ran him into the hole. So that's a, uh, you know, all these, these uh, misguided stories, but that's, uh, unfortunately there's just a uh, mindset, yes, I, the livestock industry sometimes thinks so. We always hope, we always come from a positive side, what we could do and try to work together. But unfortunately, yes, there's a lot of um, misguided perceptions. Go ahead. I was just curious if you have any partnership with schools in the sunny side, or do you guys work with The last part? Do you have any partnership with schools in the sunny side area? We're still building that up. We're only in the first year. So we just finished the first year, but as we're starting at the next restoration season, yes, some of the local churches as well. Could you flash back to the 12 compo components? Yes. So one of our themes in, in process is live like a watershed, blood streams and creeks. You know, we all live downstream. That's really, that really is helpful to a lot of people. 
the process of, of uh, looking at an ecosystem is not so much of a scientific thing, but a, a living belonging, and then seeing how your body works. I got my start once I came up off the curb. I got started in uh, physical therapy and personal training, and as I was working with a lot of, uh, particularly women, and their broken bodies, I was like, it really functions a lot like how the earth does, and so, um, you know, living relationships. So I over over years have crafted crafted this and gives people um, a sense of being part of an ecosystem rather than but you know a lot of people are trying to get people out to nature and, and youth out into nature but if it, it, if you're still perpetuating this separateness all right we nature is here and then our lives are here what is it like to go out to enjoy there's a bunch of Bankhead kids. Bankhead is one of the roughest neighborhoods in Atlanta. They're, they're camping right now. They just went out uh, yesterday. But then they have to come back to gunshots and all that. Or wherever it is. You may have whatever. And ecological health is for everybody. People have depression. People have struggled with concentrating. If they, if they start to see, they bring that vitality and, or, and even the struggle and the need for refuge and the need for life and the exhilaration of life that, that they, we, we tie ourselves more together to those, those moments, then you'll have people who are less breakable down, down the line. Any other questions? Number seven, it says, live like a watershed. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, that's one of the most powerful ones, like your body. First of all, you know, we talk about how you, know, you keep your veins and your systems flowing clean, but also we're all connected. We all live downstream. We, we will demonstrate how a watershed looks, even visually, and then wherever water, like we're in the Sims Bayou watershed out there at Esteban Park, but then you see how um, if somebody did uh, did something that was that was polluting to somebody else, you know, you can you correlate to that to a social condition or to 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 bad food or doing drugs or, or whatever. You start to see that your actions are connected to somebody else and everything else has a repercussion, good or bad. I live in the Fifth Ward area and now they're integrating uh, as far as coming in and doing redevelopment there. Is there anything in place for preserving some of the historical things there or um, preserving some of the land that is there that does have the place? I hope so. We, um, Due to uh, uh, tough economy, we haven't built out a partnership with Charles Savage in the Fifth Ward yeah. and Richard Prohm, but we're good friends, and that's all that's part of our, our vision. So, I mean, I know there's a big need, and, and Savage has even identified a few areas along Buffalo Bayou as well as right inside the neighborhoods where you could have some of these parks. And what about historical things that have been there for ages? Are they trying to? Do anything to make I hope so. Of the yeah, and I hope so because it's really, really important. You know, especially people have made it all the way through the rough times, and then if yeah. you start to have, uh, you know, redevelopment, and then people who have made it, then they get pushed out. I think that's an injustice. Yeah. And so I hope so. We need, you know, society, a healthy society, is a whole society that addresses all elements. Yeah, because they just came to the Right, and you've seen it happen in. in, in uh, Neighborhoods like you know, close in neighborhoods across the country. So, any other questions? Well, um, that was that. And, uh, if anybody wants any more information, you can reach us there. And my book uh, took me eight years to write, and I, I, GPRC has acquired all the profit rights. The ebook just came out, so any anybody, um, I invite you to come on the journey, and all the work will go to supporting. Uh, the, uh, all the resources will go to support your work. So thank you.